get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RxBars, which told their story. They sold to Kellogg for $600 million. Check out the interview of how they built that up. P90X founder Tony Horton talks about how he made money as a street mime before he sold hundreds of millions of dollars. And Baby Einstein founder talked about she's a two-time cancer. She isn't like survivor. Mark, she likes assassin because survivor is more like a victim. And the founder of Atari, Nolan Bushnell, talked about how when Steve Jobs, uh, Steve Jobs um, was his mentee, he offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000. And he talked about why he turned that down. Wow. And yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Um, and, and so many more amazing entrepreneurs like we have today, but uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran, and our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers, and we do that through three ways. We have a done-for-you event solution for large conferences or software companies, a done-for-you podcast solution, which in my opinion is, I believe is the best thing I've done for my business and I say my life, but then my wife disagrees with that, Mark. So I'll say business and life. I've made amazing best friends through this this process and a lead generation solution. Um, But we do have a greater purpose behind it, which is um, driven by uh, my business partner and I realized our grandfathers were a huge inspiration for us. Um, My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. His was a B-17 captain pilot, and there's a whole long story behind that. But to honor their legacy, we have a veteran entrepreneur scholarship. So uh, rise25.com slash mission. If you are a veteran veteran entrepreneur or you know of one, send them vet, you know, rise25.com slash mission. And it basically gets you a scholarship. We did 14 events last year. Um, it gives you a scholarship to a ticket to the conference. We're doing a VIP event at the VIP event itself or all of the above. So check that out. Um, I am excited today. Uh, we have Mark Aramley, the inventor and founder of Bedjet. Um, I think, you know, your tagline, Mark, should be, we save marriages, possibly. Um, <laughs> but uh, BedJet is the world's first rapid cooling and heating system just for your bed. And Mark started his career working on the spacesuit for NASA, and he was responsible, responsible for helping engineer elements related to heating and cooling for the interior of the spacesuit. So I guess if you could do that, you can engineer... <laughs> Uh, you know, the heating clip for a bed. Believe it or not, right? staying cool is the number one challenge. It is. Okay. In the suit. It's so well insulated. You got to get rid of the heat. I'm sure. Um, his career also included collaboration <laughs> with BMW um, on their first zero emissions hydrogen powered seven series sedan, working with Capstone Turbine Corporation, and even portable power systems for the U.S. Army and Marines. Mark, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me on the show. I was going to start with, you know, there, there's so many, so much to cover here, and uh, we will talk about the the spacesuit and NASA. But um, I want to start kind of in a, in a strange place, where is um, the video? I love the Harmon Brothers video you guys did, and if you haven't seen it, it's entertaining. My kids will ask to watch it over and over. <clears throat> so start with how the video with the Harmon Brothers came about. Right. And I had so, Daniel Harmon. I talked to him several weeks back, and it sparked. I'm like, why have Mark and I not recorded an interview? So right, right. So about? they're they're a talented bunch of guys. They've got a, a great track record. They've worked on some great brands. Uh, you know, we were just looking for a way to tell the story. I mean, the Bedjet solves so many mainstream problems. Mm -hmm. But it's not a category of product that people are even aware of. And that's our biggest challenge as a startup company is awareness of our product category. So, for example, 55% of couples will fight over the bedroom thermostat. That's a real number. I would say it's higher than that. We all relate over that, right? Little secret trips to the thermostat when no one's looking. I Uh, could detect if she turns it down one degree and I could detect if I turn it up one degree. Yeah, it was like a sixth sense, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, 
know, 80% of menopausal women will go through hot flashes and, you know, freeze their husbands out of the bedroom with AC. So, you know, it, it really does hit a lot of mainstream sort of sleep comfort issues, but we're looking for a way to tell a story, right? And, you know, you can tell it with bullet points and some nice product pictures, but I really love what the Harmon guys do. You know, I love being able to tell the story with humor and, you know, relate how we solve problems with humor. And it was perfect. Like the characters they came up with, you know, the devil who likes it hot, a devil, not the devil, who likes it. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a key part of the uh, the scripting. And, uh, and an ordinary housewife, you know, who just wants it cool. And uh, so it really conveyed the message so well. It was been a tremendous branding and marketing exercise for us. And uh, we were quite pleased with the outcome. How long did it take from beginning to end? <clears throat> well, you know, those guys are pretty busy. When we talked to them, they were red hot. They were coming off a string of, of big brand successes. And, and really, they had their pick and choose of clients. Uh, you know, they had a lot of folks knocking on their door. Uh, a big part of working with an agency like that um, where, you know, it's, it's the seller's market, not the buyer's market. They're choosing what brands to work with versus hoping business is going to come in. Uh, they have to love the product. So we started talking with them and we shipped them some bed jets and, you know, basically like everybody loves this thing here. Sure. We would love to do something with you guys. And uh, then we hit it off from there. So probably from the first day we started talking to them um, to having a contract signed was maybe three, three months. Hmm. And then once the contract was signed, it was about a six-month process to script it, film it, edit it, and finally have something that's you know ready to go. Right. So I want to talk about the after effects of the video. I mean, we will talk about. Wh I'm still curious of why they hated you so much on Shark Tank. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. I don't know if you've talked about right. it in the past, but from this video perspective, what was the after effects? So it. You talk about entrepreneurs always uh, talk about brand and branding your company and and brand power, and it's interesting. Um, I I don't spend money on brand awareness. You know, as a small company CEO, anytime a vendor pitches me on a brand awareness right. campaign, you that translates response. into yeah, it translates into does not make money. <laughs> right, that, that's yes. what brand awareness is to me. Yeah. Um, but really, we, we saw a very tangible brand awareness boost on this, meaning, uh, you know, we were doing fine with our Facebook ads and, you know, digital marketing ads. This, this definitely turbocharged um, those channels. But what we found was, for example, we have our normal PR efforts, right? Reaching out to journalists and media saying, hey, review the product, take a look at this. And suddenly we went from nobody really wanting to talk to us or a few people here and there so like, oh, yeah, I saw the video. I'd love to check mm. that product out. And so it had a cascade effect, not just help us with our direct-to-consumer um, sales and advertising, but also give us a little bit of brand power for folks who had seen it and sort of it's funny, it sticks in your head. So that when BedJet came around again in whatever fashion, we just connected better mm -hmm. uh, with those folks. So uh, definitely tangible um, benefits on the PR side, media coverage side. Uh, and, you know, I, I was proud of the piece of work. It, it was a Fantastic. well video. The, the characters were perfect. Um, people laughed, which, which we love, right? You know, turning ordinary um, uh, marital issues into humor, you know, and hey, the yeah. product solves it. And it does. We, we really are saving marriages. It's not, it's not a tagline. Yeah. So comment, I, I'm going to talk about the after effects of Shark Tank in a second, but common condition, you mentioned a few. What are the most common conditions people purchase the bed jet for that you find? So we have a couple different categories, right? Uh, we have the gadget nerds. That's me, right? Uh, the folks who love Kickstarter and just new tech and they've got to be, you know, having the latest thing. I'm like, oh, I can control my comfort in bed from my phone. Yeah, I, I got to have that. So we have that community of, of early adopters. Um, and then we have another uh, completely different community of what I'd call the, the medical, people who have issues, right? They, they either they're born with or developed. Um, you know, menopausal women's a great example. These women, certain age, and we, and we love our sweaty Bettys. They're like 25% of our, of our uh, business. Um, you know, they get the hot flashes, the night sweats, and, and there's nothing can solve it. 
and we just finished a clinical medical study mm. uh, with that demographic and found that you know a huge they, they, they were getting huge benefits on improved sleep improved daytime energy reduced complaints for night sweats and hot flashes in fact we found the product was as good as if not better than drug therapy for that particular demographic and you can roll that into other demographics you know you have athletes that just have super high metabolisms and their furnaces at night and their wives can't even sleep next to them mm. uh, chemotherapy patients you know experiencing some of the same issues as as the the um, uh, the menopause women, um, Renaud's disease, MS. I mean, so many thermoregulation issues can come out of either your unique body chemistry. There's just some people who sweat, right? right? Um, or you know, some medical condition. And then finally, the last category is um, couples, right? We're just we're solving that problem of he wants it cold, she wants it hot. Somebody's got to suffer. We fix that problem completely. You can have half the bed, you know, toasty like Hawaii and the other half, you know, cool like Alaska and everybody's happy. So talk about that for a second because I know you started with one product and talk about the evolution of you've released different products since the inception, right? Yeah. You know, BedJet's an interesting business. And you have it right there, by the way. So I don't know. People are watching the video. Yeah, so you can hold it up for a second. So this is, this is a BedJet base unit. Right, it's it's a little machine, goes under your bed, um, fits under any bed with seven inches of space, or you can put it at the foot of your bed, and it's an air-driven machine, uh, you know, and it is the most powerful product in the universe. I love saying that <laughs> uh, for either rapidly cooling and drying sweat or uh, heating up. Right, we can um, heat a king-size bed to feel like the sheets came out of the dryer. In about a minute and a half. Hmm. Um, that's no electric blanket in the world that can do that. And it's a hot, dry heat because it's air driven. In terms of cooling, you, know, you press the cool button, you feel it in 10 seconds. And um, it literally sucks the body moisture off your skin, which then, in effect, makes your body's natural cooling mechanism work better. So um, the product itself started out as a hobby project. Right. This was no grand, you know, MBA business plan and a bunch of smart people sitting around a room with product strategy. It was me. I'm a tinkerer. I love to build things. I have personal problems with being too hot in bed. You know, I've had I, I, this. This is an idea that went back to 2001. Right. So we're going back 18 years ago. I had this idea and it took me till 2014 to develop it, to finally decide to to create it and it started out as a hobby project on my kitchen table literally just to see if I could do it hmm. I tried it out and I was like whoa this thing feels really good I had other people try it out and the response was universal everybody who touched the thing loved it and it was an ugly prototype I mean it was like a steel box and, you still have you know, a picture of that oh yeah, yeah. I, have, I have it sitting in, uh, on my desk I look at it every day because it's a reminder that all great things you know, come from very, very small beginnings. So that kitchen table took us, uh, fast forward five years, we're now the number one company in the United States making climate control systems for beds. We compete against billion dollar companies like Sleep Number, Tempur-Pedic, and when it comes to active climate control systems, we're number one. And, uh, and that all started on a kitchen table with a kludgy prototype built from a broken hand dryer motor and, you know, all these other things. So. So what are the, some of the other products? Because you guys have now dual zone or maybe it's just you know additional add-ons to the bed jet. Right. What, are, what so, are some of the offerings? So we started, we started with just the single bed jet, which would cool and heat the whole bed right uh, at the same time. And uh, I have uh, the same issue 55% of couples do. I like it freezing cold. My wife likes it warm. And I'm like, let's figure out a way to solve this. Right. Right. And so we created an add-on technology. We call it the cloud sheet. But basically, the air flows into this super performance engineered but all cotton sheet and divides into two channels along each side of the bed mm. and two machines plug in. And so you can get your half side hot and your half side cool. And I actually created the prototype with a sewing machine I bought from Walmart on my living room floor, right? So, you know, you can imagine all this stuff's happening in the house. And the first time I had my wife try it out, 
uh, at that time we were um, we weren't married, but uh, I'm like, check this out, check this out. She's like, yeah, I've already tried the bed jet, whatever, right? I'm like, no, try this out. And I had the, the hot going on one side and the cool on the other mm. side. And she, she got onto the hot side and she's like, yeah, whatever, I felt this before. I'm like, slide over. And she slides her leg over to the other side mm. and just look, how did you do that? <laughs> And because, you know, there's no separation in the bed. You just go from one side to the other and you suddenly feel the cool. And I really believe that great product design, great product design, great technology, the first time you use it, it feels like magic. And that's what this did, right? I saw the look on her face. And then for a lot of couples, it's like that. You're like, how did you do that? And, and, um, and it's a wonderful feeling. So I want to walk through the journey a second. I know it started on your kitchen table with you tinkering with this, um, mm-hmm. but I know your philosophy around um, validation. Right. Right. So talk about that for a second, because you weren't so, going to stake your life savings on something just because yeah. you you created it at the kitchen table. Yeah. So I've been doing new product introduction for a long time at a lot of other startup companies. Bedjet is the first one that is, is my company. And one thing I've learned as a, as a new product guy, you never launch a product based on your opinion, uh, based on your coworkers' opinion, uh, based on Shark Tank's opinion, okay? You've got to go out and test the market, um, especially when you're an entrepreneur who's so passionate. Um, that's, that's, that's dangerous, when you're too passionate about your product because you could have a loser. Um, and the reality is most products are losers. I mean, I, I, I hate to put it that way, but the fallout and attrition rate of people who have this great idea and just try and bring it somewhere, it it's like one out of 10, you know, makes it to that home run. So you really have to do that product validation and the only opinion that matters is the opinion of the customers who are gonna take their hard-earned treasure out of their wallet and actually buy it, right? right? So, so we did a lot of market validation with Kickstarter, and I love Kickstarter. I love the community there. Uh, you know, they've been around a long time now and still going strong. We did some Kickstarters. Um, we actually went, we've done three so far in the history of the company, but the second one. We sold like $1.4 million in product in 40 days. We closed out as like the top 20 Kickstarters of all time, Mm. you know, at that time. And just wonderful, wonderful dollars and cents market validation. You can't argue with it, right? There's a, yeah, there's a, you know, there's a need. People see a need for it. There's Um, there's a need. So you do the first Kickstarter, then you do the second Kickstarter. What do you do after that? Se- that second Kickstarter was really, really blew up and was successful. Right. That's what were some I of doubled. the ups and challenges around that? The Kickstarter themselves. Yeah. Uh, this. Yeah. The second one. So, you know, the the first one, I didn't know what I was doing. I had never done a Kickstarter before. I I filmed the video myself. You know, it, it was it was. I, I look back at it now and the quality of the production and what it's just. It looks so amateur and so basic. You know. Um, but it was enough to bring in, I don't know, 50 or 50 something thousand dollars, you know, and, and that wasn't a lot. Uh, and certainly, um, wasn't the funding we needed to really get the product to market, but it was, it it was a data point that said people want this. Um, the second Kickstarter, we were a less risky product because we had the first version out in the market and the second Kickstarter was like an evolution Mm. and you really, saw the difference, the same product, same concept, same everything, but suddenly there's some product reviews out there, the the perceived risk in the Kickstarter community is a little less because we weren't you know, doing our first whirl. Um, the first Kickstarter, everybody was happy. So um, really when you take away the perceived risk in the second round, that's when we saw, wow, wow, there's a huge unmet latent demand for this product, and really, that's that's when I doubled down on the company and said, "This is, this is going to be my career. This is this is going to be my, you know, my gig until I'm dead, and and don't want to do gigs anymore." So you knew right then. Well, I, I knew before then, uh, but I had taken a a sort of risk managed approach into launching Bedjet, meaning I didn't quit my day job. 
Uh, and I recommend this to every single entrepreneur out there. There's plenty of people who say, you got to be all in, you know, put everything aside. You gotta... No, don't do it. <laughs> do not do it. Do not give up your cash paying day job until you prove that this new thing can pay your bills. Because that's where most entrepreneurs fall down. They, they, they're in a situation that the company's not profitable. It's not making money. They're not making money. They can't pay their bills. The whole thing comes crashing down. Um, Bedjet was a more measured launch. You know, I had my day job. I had an existing consulting business. I kept it going. I, I weeded out clients and sort of shrunk that as Bedjet grew and finally got to the spot where I'm like, I'm all in. But that was a very risk measured approach. And, uh, could things have gone faster? You know, had I been all in? Yeah. But I, I also could have gone bankrupt and, uh, you know, not been able to, to pay my mortgage. Uh, yeah. So those are those are big things that I, I think are responsible for the crash of more startups than anything else is yeah. the, the entrepreneur not being able to pay their bills to keep the whole thing going long enough. Yeah, and you said you you know you calculated it so that you were able to um, pay the bills. And um, at what point did mortgaging houses? come into to play so that was just to get going so and that leads into shark tank okay right? so i went to shark tank we were not in production yet um we had prototypes the prototypes looked just like the real thing they acted like the real thing but we hadn't actually built or sold any other than the first kickstarter and um actually we we had some intent level pre-orders from a, a, a australian company that were, were quite interesting so shark tank was but, between kickstarter one and two is that yes. where it falls in the timeline? Yes. Gotcha. Shark Tank was before we shipped the product. So nobody had a bed yet. We had no um, recognized revenue. Yeah. So they hated me. Well, they hated let's back my up product. for a second, Mark, because I think there were tens of thousands of people who applied for Shark Tank. And you were one of, like, what, 20 or something like that. So right? the numbers are 40,000 people apply. 40, they fly out 200 to Los Angeles, and of that 200, around 120 to 150 mm -hmm. will actually be on air. Why did they choose you? You know what's interesting? Uh, I didn't even apply for the show. You didn't. So I'm a very unusual Shark Tank case. Most people apply to the show. They go to casting calls. There's so many gates that cut you down to that last pool of 200 people, and they called me. Hmm. Uh, I, I never even watched the show. I'd never even seen a single episode. I've heard you? of it. Um, the Kickstarter. So hmm. there's another benefit of Kickstarter. Um, you know, it was very visible. Uh, a lot of press looks for uh, new things to cover, new gadgets and stuff on Kickstarter. So one of their producers reached out to me and said, hey, this thing looks kind of neat. Why don't you apply to the show? Hmm. I'm like, I don't know. I've never watched it. Let me watch a couple. And uh, I think they liked it. They liked the idea of putting two sharks in bed together, mm. right, for the show. So uh, I had to go through the same process everybody else did, but there was a little bit of recruiting on the front end on their side, yeah. which is very, very rare, by the way. It doesn't happen too often. So you go on Shark Tank, and they hate you. No. Nah, they hate me. They hate my product. <laughs> they tell me nobody will ever want one, and I'm going to burn in hell. You know how that... That well, I guess goes. it goes back to your Harmon Brothers video. So. <laughs> I guess it does. It goes full circle. I, I think he said even the devil wouldn't buy one, actually. There you go. Like, that so. should, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what did we not see? Because <clears throat> I know there's a lot they added out. So you're up there for an hour. I was up there for an hour to an hour and 20 minutes. Um, and they cut that down to the 12 minutes that they want you to see. Um, it was a great experience, you know, the whole process of going through the casting, you know, arriving in Los Angeles, dealing with the production crew, everybody there is really nice, really pleasant. They're rooting for you, you know, um, but I, I can't tell you that my conversation with the sharks was like a legitimate investor conversation. Um, there, there were elements of it that just didn't make sense. They'd ask a question and then I'd answer it and then someone would say, well, you didn't answer the question. I'm like, I, I, I did. Um, and, and so th there was part of me that felt like this is TV. 
you know, I wouldn't be having a conversation like this if I was in front of five VC entrepreneurs, hmm. right, in a private investment meeting. So, um, but reality TV is what it is. Uh, and I was very thankful for the opportunity. Uh, and it was a huge net positive for yeah. our company and launching. The thing with Shark Tank, you don't need a deal. You just need to go through your segment with a product that actually resonates with people, and ours is one of those, and manage to get off without making a complete dick out of yourself and being completely unlikable. Because if you do that, nobody's going to want to look at your product anyway. Um, you know, I get mixed reviews on my performance there. Some people say, you know, yeah, you, you, weren't, you weren't too likable, and some people say you got a bad rap. Um, at the end of the day... What was the after effect after uh, the episode went live? You know, it's it's funny. Um, you go through so many rounds of preparation. And I prepared for every conceivable question, scenario, except one. That they would hate the product and instantly take uh, a, a non-liking to me. It was the only thing I did not prepare for. So... And, and the reason why is all along the way, you know, we're going to trade shows. We're putting this thing at, at the Las Vegas market. Everyone is coming to us. And these are the titans of industry. Uh, oh, this thing's great. We've been watching you. You know, Tempur-Pedic sent over their whole delegation. Sleep Number came over. You know, all these companies came over. And, you know, all these other companies wanted to carry the product. And, um, you know, we had a deal with Mattress Firm right out of the gate. So everyone is telling us along the way this is a great idea. We've been looking for something like this. And then suddenly I walk into this forum where they're like, this thing's stupid. Uh, so I just, I, I hadn't prepared for that, um, uh, that scenario. And, you know, for about uh, 30 minutes, it was very much a devastating feeling, you know, 30 minutes to four. And, and you know what's interesting is when you get off the show, they have a psychologist sit with you. <laughs> so you don't just get to wander what did they off say and to go you? home. No, they bring you back to the ready room and they ask you some questions and, you know, how you feel. They want to make sure you don't want to do it. You're like, I'm going to kill myself. Well, I mean, there's a lot of folks who go there and they feel their whole lives, you know, are depending on the outcome. Totally. And I tell everyone, and Shark Tank is not a business model, right? It's not something you depend on to launch. Your business has to be able to launch on its own with funds you raise on your own. That that is like a, a lottery ticket that some folks get and that's all you can look at it as um i want to talk about you have an interesting you've approached retail and direct to consumer so talk about your original retail strategy what happened and then we'll talk about direct to consumer right so interesting so you know coming into uh our first year to me success was defined as we got to get as many strategic retailers as we can. We're going to be in Bed Bath & Beyond and we're going to do Brookstone and we're going to do Mattress Firm and we're going to be in all the mattress stores. And we were very successful for a new company with a new product and actually getting some of those retailers to test the product. And what I very quickly learned, because we are a new product in a new category that never existed before. So we had no existing river of demand that we were dipping our cup into. We had to create the demand. Um, and still to this day, I think if you asked a random segment of the population, did you know you can get a climate controlled bed system? They're like, what? You know? Yeah. Uh, the awareness uh, is, is the it's, problem. It's the awareness. And so, you know, we did some events with Mattress Firm, for example. And when I was on the floor, physically there, the attachment rate was phenomenal, hmm. right? The, the salespeople would pitch it, maybe 10, 15, 20% of bed purchases, they'd get a bed yet. The second I was not on the floor, nothing moved and nothing sold. Hmm. Um, what I came to understand is in order to succeed in retail with a product like this, we would have needed a multi-million dollar national advertising campaign to drive consumer to retail, okay? And you know we're trying to figure out how to do that. And meanwhile, the direct-to-consumer sales are just taken off. Yeah. And they were the bread and butter of the company for the first few years. So we did a parallel path, direct-to-consumer and retail. And about two years in, I said, you know what? Why am I going to spend multiple millions of dollars to build the brand of these retailers who are making more money per sale than I am, by the way, because their gross margins are astronomical, um, versus build my own, spend that money on building our own brand 
build consumer awareness of the market segment and then go back to retail when people are looking for us there. And so best strategy decision I ever made, uh, we fired all our retailers. We actually said mattress firm, no thanks. Bed Bath & Beyond, no thanks. Was We're that a tough decision at the time or no? No, the data was overwhelming. It was. You know, it was like, here we are moving slow as molasses on the retail side and on the direct to consumer side, like we're not doing anything and it's taking off on its own. Mm. So, um, you know, at those, at that stage of the company, we were paycheck to paycheck and, you know, month to month. I mean, everything was about cash flow. So, um, I was chasing the cash flow and that's where it was coming from. Best decision I ever made, took a lot of overhead out of the company, dealing with retailers like Bed Bath & Beyond and Mattress Firm. It's all this administrative stuff, so many layers of uh, satisfying their requirements, mm -hmm. that taking all that away and just saying, hey, bedjet.com, that's all we're going to worry about for the next year, yeah. really simplified things for us and gave us control of the brand gave us control of the consumer's experience post-purchase. Um, and it's allowed us now, we're going to be introducing another product later this year, which is super secret, and going to be just as big and innovative as, uh, innovative as BedJet. Now we have you know, this massive list of BedJet owners, right? I own their emails. I own their, their information. You know, they're, they're in our ecosystem. And you know, that allows us to funnel new innovations to this group of people who already love us, love our product, love our company, um, versus had I done all this in retail, yep. how do I know who bought my product at Bed Bath? Yeah, you don't own the customer at that point. You don't point. own the customer. Yeah, and it sounds like an 80-20 scenario where it's like you were spending 80% of your time with this infrastructural logistical stuff and it wasn't producing the... The sales, like the yeah, it, 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 we were selling, but just it, it wasn't exciting, um, and the margins weren't as good as direct to consumer. And at the end of the day, you just gotta evaluate what the data is telling you, mm -hmm. and make a smart decision. The data was telling us retail was not the right way to go. Mark, when you shifted to direct to consumer, what were some of the things that did work? Mm -hmm. What channels did you then explore or or go on? So, I mean, the obvious places, Amazon, um, you know, and and Amazon is kind of a necessary evil mm -hmm. in the world of direct to consumer e-commerce. Yeah. I mean, if you ask me as a consumer, where do I buy all my stuff? Amazon, right? If you ask me as a vendor and a merchant, what do I think about Amazon? I think they're a terrible company to work with. They're <laughs> they're, they're terrible to their merchants. Do you do yeah. FBA or we do FBA? You do FBA. Um, you know, it's it's kind of a necessary evil. You have to be there. The company Amazon is so pro consumer that what they lay down on the merchants is so um, uh, heavy handed is is the best word I would use. Mm -hmm. uh, but but you have to be there. Right. So, you know, that was a logical place. And and in fact, one thing I would caution invest, uh, entrepreneurs about when you're first starting, you know, our first year, we probably did 50 percent of our sales on Amazon. We didn't know what the heck we were doing with e-commerce. Right. We just put up a cheap two thousand dollar website, put it on Amazon, crossed our fingers and boom, people were, were buying. Um, we're much more sophisticated now and uh, we understand the landscape and, and how to get to consumers now. That first year, Amazon was 50% of our sales. Uh, it's a very easy place to get started, but I caution every entrepreneur out there, use it as a first place to get to the market really cheap and really easy, but if your business is 50% dependent on Amazon, your business is in danger because you don't own the customer, you don't own the brand, Amazon can wave their hand, and in a blink, your sales are down by 90% because of a change in an algorithm, or they decided to have their own branded Amazon product that competes with yours. They don't care about you, the small business person. They care about their customers. And it's just, it's such a divided opinion I have of Amazon because if you ask me as a consumer, I tell you, I love buying my stuff there. Yeah. I think I have a dual personality here on this topic. But uh, as a merchant, a uh, very dangerous place to let um, really more than 20, 25% of your revenue depend on because things can change there like that. Yeah. I mean, Mark, as a engineer and product inventor, when I hear Kickstarter <clears throat> or Amazon, one thing that, that comes to my mind is knockoffs. Right. So how do you fend off knockoffs and right. talk about that landscape a little bit? I remember one lady who was on Shark Tank who had, she said she got knocked off like crazy 
um, right. after Shark Tank, Kickstarter, all those. Right. I mean, you hear stories of people on Kickstarter who have this great Kickstarter, and before they even delivered their own backers, some factory in China is already shipping exactly. the same thing. Yours right. is a little more complicated. Than, so than we, we have a complicated yeah. product. I mean, our product is electromechanical. It's got controllers and a, a lot of software in our product. So while physically, you know, if you were to send this off to some factory to, to retro engineer, they could create the hardware, the software is probably and and how we forced sort of low low cost electronics to perform like very high end electronics with the controls on the heaters and such. Um, I mean, this thing has more features and more capability, same and more capability as an eighteen hundred dollar medical device, right? Hmm. That you find in hospitals. They right. have sort of similar technologies, and we pulled it off for a couple hundred bucks. Same level of thermal accuracy, all this stuff. So, so a lot of it's in the software. Um, we did invest money in patents early on. So even when the money was thin, we found a, a, a reasonably priced patent attorney. From the start, we were filing those. We've got a patent portfolio of like seven patents now. Um, but the knockoffs are arriving this year. So, are they really? You know. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and and it's interesting when you demonstrate success universally. People are going to see it and want to take a piece away from you. That's just the world of business. You can't feel bad about it. it it's just part of the, the product life cycle chain. So we, I thought it was going to be about two years before the knockoffs showed up, and now it's, it's closer to three or four. Um, and they're showing up this year. You know, There's some Canadian company that has uh, you know, tried to duplicate a lot of what we've done. They're not yet shipping. They had a Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Um, there's a few other smaller companies, you know, entering the field. Um, but you know, we compete against sleep number who has their version of a bed jet, right? So, um, how do we really fend that off? Um, it's not in patent court, you know, you got to spend half a million dollars to enforce a patent. We do it by innovating and just keeping ahead of the knockoffs. So, you know, we're releasing the next generation bed jet in literally weeks. And the remote control is the most advanced remote control in the sleep industry. It's got a color screen. Um, the electronics, it's got smart home and, and Wi-Fi and Alexa. It's 30% smaller. So rather than try to fight these guys in patent court, which, which we may if they ever yeah. take a big bite, we stay ahead by just releasing newer and better product and just staying a generation ahead of the knockoffs. That's really the right. only thing you can do. Mark, I have uh, two last questions, Mark, and I just want to say thank you. This is, I, I love hearing these stories, and everyone should check out bedjet.com. Uh, where else should we point people towards? It's a great domain, by the way. I'm surprised it was available. <laughs> it wasn't. Our oh, first domain was bedjets.com, and I wound up buying it a, a year or two in from a guy in Australia who, whose business model was good hotel rooms at airports. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Bedjet. <laughs> Good domain. Yeah. Bedjet.com. Anywhere else we should point people towards to check out the products? Uh, that's it. You okay. know, you want to Google Bedjet. We've got uh, literally hundreds of product reviews, video reviews. Um, you go take a look at Amazon. And, and this is my favorite claim right now. And it's going to sound like a big, broad marketing hyperbole. Bedjet is the number one customer rated product in the entire mattress category on all of Amazon. Hmm. Sounds boastful, but if you go and look for any product with over 500 reviews, a volume product, in the mattress category, we have the highest percentage of five-star reviews of any product that's the versus like 2,000 other companies in the category. So we're very, very proud hmm. of that. That's great. Love it. Um, so, Mark, two things. One, I always like to hear... Uh, low moment a challenge in in the life cycle of the business and then two on the flip side what's been a proud moment so what's been a low moment big challenge for you um in our first year there was a lot of financial uncertainty a lot uh and i actually had to delay my wedding mm. for this business and so when you talk about um how entrepreneurs can pay a personal price uh, you know, I, I met this amazing woman, we got engaged, um, 
literally uh, three or four weeks, she's uh, away from mailing out the invitations, and Bedjet is launching that month. And we have a, a wedding scheduled for later that year. And I'm just thinking, what if this thing doesn't go, right? What if, it, what if, what if we have wind up with some horrible warranty recall issue? Like all these risks, right? The worst pot case scenarios are running. Because you're just thinking of right. everything that can go wrong. And you constantly have to be thinking of everything that can go wrong, right? In a, in a hardware business like this, whether it's QC, warranty issues, all that. And I go to her, I'm like, uh, babe, babe, babe. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be able to write the checks in October. I'm really worried about it. And if you can imagine um, going to a woman who just got a ring on her finger and she's shopping for wedding dresses and she's putting the invitations together and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That was tough, right? And I'm very lucky that I had a, a supportive fiance. It took her a few days what to get on. What did she say? I didn't sign up days. for this, Mark. No, uh, it, it took her a few days, uh, you know, to because that's a that's a big surprise. Uh, and after that, entirely supportive, behind me all the way, you know, do what you need to do, and we we can put this off. And I put it off um, till the next year. Now, the moral of that story: How did it turn out? It turned out I could have written the checks. Okay, the business took off right away, and when that wedding date came around, I would have been we would have been just fine. Um, but what I did for her. The next year was give her a much uh, a much nicer wedding than we would have had, hmm. uh, out of out of thankfulness, you know, that she was patient and um, and waited, yeah. you know, and supported me on it. So on the flip side, proud moments. What's been a really proud moment for you? Uh, when we got written up by CNBC and Kiplingers as one of the top five or top ten most successful fails in the history of Shark Tank. <laughs> So that definitely made me feel really, really good. Yeah. Love it. Everyone should check it out. Bedjet.com. Um, thank you, Mark. And they're saving marriages one marriage at a time. And, you know, more importantly, menopause, chemotherapy, and all the conditions that really have issues with, you know, the body regulation. Sleep Heat, yeah, sleep, sleep temperature. temperature. So thank you for what you do. Really appreciate it, Mark. That's my pleasure. Thanks yeah. for having me on. Between my eyes, walked through the fire, came out better.